Ladies and gentlemen, Sentinels in the building! Yeah, hell yeah! <laughs> hell yeah! Chris, we appreciate you. While we're waiting for uh, your buddy to join, could you please properly introduce yourself? Let us know about uh, whereabouts in the world you are right now and uh, plug or promote anything you'd like. Uh, cool. So I'm uh, Chris. I play guitar. Um, oh, there. I think yeah. I actually just got a notification about Dave, I think. Dave's in here. He's coming in right now. Dave's What's up, Dave? In here. There he is. What's going on? Uh, nothing, dude. We appreciate you stopping by. We were just getting the, uh, the introduction from Chris. Chris, where where are you located right now? Right now, um, I'm actually in Connecticut. I'm at my girl's house, um, but I live in New Jersey, so I uh, go back and forth a lot. But yeah, I mean, I'm from New Jersey. Hell yeah, uh, Dave. Could you please properly introduce yourself? Plug anything you'd like, and uh, of course, let us know where you are in the world right now as well. I am Dave Rookie. I'm the drummer for Sentinels. Uh, secondary vocalist, lyricist. Um, uh, I'm also currently in my home in New Jersey. Hell yeah. As one that does vocals while drumming, what is that like from, from someone that doesn't do either anymore, but from a win perspective, like, do you have to train yourself to play a certain way to be able to hit the notes or is it just come naturally because you've done it for so long? It's, it's definitely different. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, the, the thing that kicks my, my ass is the fact that I don't practice it when I'm at home like that. I just kind of practice my vocal parts separately than drumming, but because I'm so familiar with my drum parts, I just kind of apply it like at a full rehearsal with the band, like at our, our practices. And, uh, usually it's rough the first time around, but you know, I think I've gotten to a point where I'm pretty confident with it, but it is difficult because you have to turn your head. So when you turn your head, it doesn't come out quite as good as it does if you're just facing forward. So that's that's my big disadvantage. I got you. I, I've always wondered too uh, if if there was ever a need for a second mic. Like you said, you turn your head, or you can just naturally do the whole fill roll, like the toms all the way over here. Or if there was ever a reason to have another mic like over here for that same reason. That, that might sound crazy, yeah, but does that make sense? It's tough trying to find a second mic, but yeah, I, I also, when, when like arranging the lyrics and the vocals, I tried not to place them over any intricate fills. I just tried to keep it over grooves to keep it as simple as possible. Um, because when you're doing it over intricate fills or whatever, it, it makes it so much harder than it already is. Hell yeah. Uh, just gotta get the headpiece. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there's... <laughs> We got to get the the seven dust Morgan Rose, uh, like practically invisible like headpiece. The, the Britney so can, Spears yeah. mic, yeah, like, <laughs> yep, yeah, exactly. Hell yeah! This is actually my uh, my co-host for today. By the way, this is Michaela right here. Michaela, toss out a question for uh, for the fellows while I set up a music video there, so we can jam. What are you guys jamming to lately? Ooh, good thing I have my phone right next to me because I'm all flat <laughs> remembering what I listen to. New boundaries. That's the first thing that that comes to oh, mind. Nice. Uh, anything like outside the box we wouldn't expect uh so while we were actually on tour um i like felt i knew a couple songs by this band but i uh i like really got into them more recently too um the 1975 i started like listening oh, yeah. to them a little more um and this band modern chemistry too they're awesome they're i can't even describe them they're like rock uh and like indie ish uh but very like instrumental too it's it's cool Probably like those are the two main out of the box, I guess, stuff I've been listening to. I can dig it. Dave, uh, same question. Something something that you're just nonstop playing and then something we totally wouldn't expect that you're jamming in your personal time. Man, I don't know if I have much that would be considered like not expected, but uh, lately, uh, you know, the new Counterparts record is coming out soon. So they're one of my favorite bands. So I've been like binging their their singles recently um i have really been obsessed with the the new thornhill album heroin this year that that one yeah really took me by it's really good since i, Dude, I was thornhill never, is sick yeah I, I was never really familiar with them before this album came out but then chris was like 
did you listen to it yet? Did you listen to it? I'm, I'm great. I'm great. He, he hounded me. Like, all right, man, I will. I missed out on probably what's like my favorite thing of the year. Yeah. It's uh, I, I need that, though, because I'm very stubborn when it comes out uh, to, to checking, checking out bands that I haven't listened to before. So I need someone to like chain me down and, and put it on against my will almost or else I'll, I'll never remember to check things out. They're pretty music videos, bad at that. Their music videos are really cool, too. They're yeah, sick. They have, they they're got awesome. Got a going on. Talk to uh, me about Australia. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to I, I was just going to say, I, I swear Australian bands just have, like, they know, they have the formula down for every band. <laughs> for real. Yes, like, they really do. All their music videos are always super sick. The The production is always super sick. Obviously the music too, but like everything that just comes with it, they always nail, I feel. So talk to me I about agree. Embers. What, is, what does Embers <laughs> mean from a lyrical perspective? <laughs> um, to put it briefly, because it's, it's pretty extensive, um, Embers is about um, suppressing um, suppressing thoughts and um, you know I guess desires that that you that you may have that you feel like if you were to express it to somebody like if you're in a relationship and like I'll just give you the full thing I don't give a shit anymore I've talked about it on podcasts before I'll just hammer it out um, it's essentially about you know being in a relationship where you're unhappy but you're afraid to end it because you don't want to hurt that person and so you're suppressing all these urges you know and temptations from outside you know people or whatever it is that you know can negatively affect your relationship so it's really about you know suppressing and, and hiding these these thoughts that like you're too afraid to confess to anybody so like you'd rather them you'd almost let them take over you and and uh basically consume you in 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 darkness and depression because you're you know you don't want to give in to these temptations and you don't want to end the thing that you know means more than said temptations i guess so like embers was you know putting it in in terms of fire which is you know like if you play with fire you're gonna you're gonna get consumed and you're gonna you're gonna lose everything that means anything to you so you know, there's definitely some personal experience in there, and luckily it's a thing in the past now. Um, that because that's what this whole record served for me was just like kind of purging all uh, like past uh, darknesses. So, yeah, th this one was a special one, and uh, I'm glad it got to uh, to to be like the lead single from this record. That's uh, that's heavy, man. Let's check it out and uh, see what we think. Embers, mm. some tasty riffs right there, Chris. How does how Thank does a, a Sentinels yeah. song start from scratch? Um, so I most of the time it's like it starts from a riff. It doesn't matter where it ends up in the song, but I either write forward with it or like backwards with it, um, and try to like finish as much as I can. Um, I feel like writing intros to songs is like the hardest thing to do. I feel like it's the first thing people hear. Um, it, it's got to grab them like right off the the cuff. So. I feel like I always take my time with it with when it comes to that, uh, like, you know, approach to it. So I start from somewhere in the song. It could be a breakdown that's in my head. It could be a riff that's in my head. Um, I jot it down in logic. I have like a, just use a doll record straight in, um, record the idea and then go forward with it, like continue the song or like go backwards with it. So I feel it's different every time for the most part though, but mostly it's from just riffs kind of building to a song. But sometimes I get lucky and I'm able to like write intros and then through the whole song and it, uh, it, it just flows really well. But yeah, most of the time it just starts from a riff. Regarding uh, the new album Collapse by Design, who did you guys go to for production on it? Who did all, all the final? I don't know if maybe you DIY'd it yourself and you sent it somewhere else for mixing and mastering because you said you have uh, a DAW. But do you did you go somebody else to somebody else to do the actual final recordings? Yeah, we did uh, Randy LaBeouf at... Uh, at the time, it was Graphic Nature Studios, but now uh, he's doing his own thing. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Like, I don't know if he's uh, under that name anymore, but Randy LaBeouf um, has done sick records. You know, he's done Kubla Khan, Gideon, so Boundaries, so many bands that you can think of. Um, and uh, also, Aaron Chaparian was helping too during the process. He engineered it um, or engineered guitar. Um, I think he helped with some lyrics, right, Dave? 
Yeah, he he helped. Uh, he's been involved in the production process uh, for every piece of Sentinels music over time. So he, I know his skill when it comes to you know trying to figure out tricky vocal patterns and stuff. So I, I was in a a, a pinch, and like kind of running out of time to write lyrics. So he helped uh, write some of the lyrics and pretty much uh, started all like the vocal phrasings for track three, Comfort and Familiar Pain. So yeah, he he had a, he's had a big hand in our stuff like the whole the whole time that we've been a band, and so like, it's we fun. can always trust him for ideas. Yeah, I was gonna say it's funny how it like worked out too, because like regardless, we were gonna like bring Aaron along with like the the studio process, regardless of the album. Um, but you know, like the first two records we did with him, he mixed and mastered them. Obviously, did the whole thing, engineered it all, and then by the time we got picked up by our old record label, they um, wanted us to go to Randy LaBeouf. So. When we went there, Aaron was conveniently also interning, I think, at the time at the studio that Randy was also working at. So they already knew each other, like other than just perfect us bringing him along. You know, they, he, Aaron, Randy was like, yeah, like he loved Aaron and everything. So it was cool that it kind of met up eventually anyways without us, you know, like just, you know, I don't know. It, it just happy it worked out. I do want to ask a, a couple more questions, play another song or two before I do. I have a chat question coming in, but I want to know some. I want to do some trivia with you guys also. This is kind of like the fun part of the show. But uh, you guys get to pick the trivia topic. What movie or TV show could you guys agree on that you've seen more than a hundred times? It could be anything from Harry Potter to Terminator to South Park to the Marvel Universe. Doesn't matter. But if I ask you trivia on this movie or TV show, you will not get stumped. I feel like I think of one a TV show that me and Dave have probably seen a lot. Uh, yeah. Which show? Breaking Bad. Yeah. Okay. I would say that's that's the go-to. <laughs> Breaking Bad it totally works. Have you seen uh, all the Saul episodes too? Yeah, I just finished the series. Cool. I thought it was a pretty I cool ending. Of, I, I kind of well fell beginning off on Better Call Saul personally, but I'll go back to it eventually. For sure. Uh, what's this, what's the second song you would like us to play off the new album that uh, while I look up trivia on Breaking Bad? But you guys get to pick whatever whatever you'd like us to jam. Do you have any ideas, Dave? I mean, man, it's tough. You know, we'll go with a deeper cut instead of a single. <laughs> How about we go, uh, let's say let's go obsolete. That's obsolete. A one. That's a good a one. Short and sweet one. Let's yeah. jam it. Let's jam it. Oh, right, fellas, this is tough. The goal of this is to stump you now. So here we go. Breaking Bad trivia begins here now. <laughs> Season two, first episode. Walt and Jesse witness Tuco beating the henchman No Dawes to death. They are both rattled by witnessing the murder. Walt and Jesse sit in Jesse's car and they can't believe it. Walt quickly figures out how much more money he needs to make sure his family is taken care of after his death. It's kind of a weird amount. What is the amount he tells Jesse? <laughs> can we say like uh, a relatively close answer? Like, can we guess in like like the thousands at least? That sure, we get it right? sure, sure. Is it like? Oh wait, I don't know, Dave. Do you happen to know? Because I have an idea in my head. It's but... less than a million, but it's a weird number. Yeah, I think it was around. Oh, God, I have like two answers, which is shitty. So I got. Uh, is it I know like I know it was either he said around six hundred or eight hundred thousand. I, I think I, I remember six hundred thousand six hundred thousand too, I think is what I remember. That's what I was gonna say, six hundred thousand something. Yeah. Fellas, this is incorrect. Oh. Fuck. It's actually seven hundred and thirty seven thousand <laughs> is the exact amount yeah. and it's it's a right. it's an Easter egg from Vince Gilligan. He cleverly places the hidden message in the title. The message actually indicates what happens in the finale. 737 down over ABQ. I don't know what the hell that means. Oh, okay. That's, that's pretty sick. Insane. Yeah, so, that's, that's crazy. Had you gotten it, we would have spun this wheel right here. Oh. <laughs> Do you guys listen to dub dubstep whatsoever? Other than like the obvious like Skrillex, I feel. <laughs> yeah. in, in high school, yeah, it was Skrillex and like Zed's Dead or something, but that was really about it. 
Fair enough. We'll we'll skip the dubstep for now. I'll get back to it later. Do you guys do you guys play video games at all? Uh, I used to a lot. Well, what did you play? Uh, a lot of Call of Duty. That was like the main go to, and I didn't keep up at all. I like did Modern Warfare Two. That was my first Call of Duty game, and then I kept up did like Black Ops, Black Ops Two. Didn't play like Ghosts or anything else. I played Advanced Warfare. That was actually like surprisingly sick. Um, While you're on then, tour, why new... not bust out the uh, the Call of Duty Mobile on your phone? So Danny, our bassist, actually does that. I think I don't know if he still does it as much, Excellent. but he was addicted to that. Yeah, he, he was addicted to that thing. Maybe oh. want to. <laughs> For sure, I play I played all all the time. That's why that's why I always bring up Call of Duty Mobile. But uh, fellas, if there if there is ever a worst gig you ever played in Sentinels, can we hear the story of how terrible that show was? It happens to every band. Maybe your your strings broke on the first song. Uh, everything was just out of tune. I don't know. Give me a terrible gig story for the band. Oh, man. I don't know like if I've had like a worst ever. Yeah, I, I... I mean, the collection of the tour we did in 2018, like the collection of that tour was probably just like a lot of bad experiences. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was mostly due to the fact that the the tour was poor, like extremely poorly put together. Um, it was announced with I think three weeks notice, and so nobody knew about it. The bands on the tour, nobody knew of us, and we were like a direct support slot for this band above us, who also didn't have a huge fan base. I'm not mocking or or knocking any of the bands it was just a very poorly put together tour so the attendance on that tour was rough and it was like a 30 day tour with only 15 shows because there were more days off than any than shows and th- there was one show i remember it was like the most soul crushing we played in washington dc at this place called i think the pinch and <laughs> It was down, it was like, first off, downstairs. So you have to load all, like, your stuff down this, like, tight, windy staircase. And then we played to two people, which was a girl who wanted to come to the show and then her mom. Uh, that was it. And we got paid via door deal, not guarantee pay. <laughs> so we, we had to make a certain amount of the door. And then you get a percentage of what you make at the door. So we walked out with less than what we walked in with because we didn't get like money to eat or anything like that. So that that was a pretty soul crushing experience. I think the same show, my amp like exploded. Yes. All right. That is. Yeah. That's a good good event. Yeah. Yeah. Your your amp blew. (laughs) Some some someone was like going back there. And I think people were just like rewiring shit and someone plugged my input to my output in the back. So when you turned it on, it just like connected to itself and it didn't turn on. And then people just said it started to smell like smoke. And then it just, it blew. It literally, we looked back there wow. and it was just like fried. No. So that, that no. was really bad. That was my real goodness. Bad. Devastating. Yeah. Devastating. Yeah. Something similar. Yeah. It happened to us in Poland. Uh, like their, their voltage. <laughs> Uh, is very different from ours so we you know weren't really told about that or weren't weren't really aware of that and a lot of the power converters that you know the tour package had to rent for this tour you know were also faulty so when we plugged stuff into there which was plugged into the venue's electricity it completely blew uh the power conditioner in chris's like guitar rack which also powered our tracks, Danny's bass, my triggers. So Mid-ease, it just sound, yeah. it sounded like all the power went out during our set. So we played the intro of our set, had to figure it out. We're like, oh, okay, we're good. And then we p- played the intro again and got halfway through inertia. And we had to, I basically had to perform stand up comedy while we tried to sh- troubleshoot before inevitably having to just get off the stage because we couldn't perform. It was Cause we, pretty we, yeah, embarrassing. Dang. <laughs> we uh sound checked like in two hours before and everything was fine so when it happened my amp was also not only did it like kind of blow my amp was like pulsing through the cab 
it was just like given like a low end like do 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 and the it was clipping while it was doing it so i was just like what's happening and our midi controller that was controlling like mine and danny danny's axe effects wasn't turning on at all so it, it was just a mess it was so so messy aye, aye, aye. Too. so like i was i was stoked to be there you know <laughs> it was awesome same Chat like, chat go. uh wants to know uh how long have you guys been with Sharp Tone and would you would you say it's a, a fairly awesome experience? It's absolutely an awesome experience. Um they they're they were like the goal label for us to to hopefully sign to like, you know, back in the day when we were, you know, getting way more serious about things and uh you know, we just knew that that was the market we wanted to be a part of and um Luckily enough, they got wind of our music and they liked it and you know, offered us a deal. And it, it's been amazing ever since. Um, but we signed with them, um, I would say, late 2019, early 2020. So, yeah, it's been about like uh, just over two years or just about. Hell, yeah. It's been incredible. Couldn't ask for a better label. Awesome. Definitely. That's what I hear from everybody when we ask them about, about Sharp Tone. And they helped us set this up, so I appreciate them as well. Uh, I think we've got time for maybe just a couple more. Michaela. Do you have a a final question for the fellas? What band like first got you guys into music like in the first place? Like wh- like heavier music, anyways. Heavier music, okay. Um, <laughs> Chris, do you need to think on that or? Uh, I mean, so it it was a transition for me. Like, so I started with like you know uh, like the used and. My chem, like my chem, when like three cheers, and because I'm I'm 25, and when I was like in sixth grade or fifth grade, I think that was when like Black Parade came out. So I got into that, uh, went into you know like the used and more like emo kind of punk ish kind of stuff. Did you did you brother, black your eyes? Did you black your eyes out? Oh, dude, no, I wanted to dye my hair black, and like I had like Bieber hair at the time, so I wanted to like dye it black and like swish it, you know, put it like always do like this every 10 seconds. <laughs> Uh, yeah, literally just like a little, little <laughs> head twitch. Um, but then my brother started to show me like Slipknot and like Asking Alexandria and more just like heavier stuff around like 2009 or so. And then he brought me to local shows and he just like started my whole like mental networking of all these like genres, heavy bands that were kind of in within the metal genre, you know, um, like bands like Balance, uh, not really metal. So it kind of just like branched out after like my chem be used slipknot and it kind of just kind of went from there. For sure. Yeah. Nice. For me, my my heavy gateway bands were um first it was under oath. Um I heard uh reinventing your exit on Fuse and I was like, music like this exists, like this is incredible. So yeah, right. that and then um duality by slipknot. Um that was like my first real taste of heavier music and what it could be. And then it turned into like, you know, Lamb of God, Kill Switch, Engage, um, a lot of stuff like that. So those those were like my gateways. And I, I can't remember if I heard Deftones before I heard Under Oath when I was a kid because my aunt's like, husband, you know, all the time I would hang with him when I was a kid and he brought me to my first shows and he was always playing Deftones and whatnot. So he was getting me into stuff like that and then Drowning Pool with, you know, but the bodies at the floor. Like, that was <laughs> Hell yeah. Like, yeah. It's all like the like, those go to. So yeah, it was um but I, I give it credit mostly though to under Oath and Slipknot. Hell yeah. I feel too like when when I was younger too, I'm I'm sure Dave, you probably were in the same boat too. Uh I was listening to like, you know, whatever my parents were putting on, which was like rock and like heavy rock, whatever it was at the time, like Q one oh four three, one oh five point five. And I feel like I heard a lot of like the white pony deftones or like older Deftones and like Incubus kind of stuff at the time yeah. when I was younger and didn't really oh, yeah. check back on it until I was like 22. And I was like, yo, this actually sounds like super familiar, but I haven't like listened to this for sure in the last like 10 years. So I feel like unintentionally listening to more stuff just from like the radio when I was growing up was also like a key factor into like more heavy stuff. Definitely. It was the same for me. 
My uh, my final question for you guys is, uh, and I appreciate you doing this, by the way. Uh, my final question, I ask every guest we have on the show the same question. What is a, a piece of musical advice that you could share with us that maybe somebody in the industry has told you that was like an eye opener for you or a terrible mistake you made early on in your career that you don't want any starting up band to make? Man. I don't know if really if we received any like musical advice, I guess, from like music industry people too much. Like, I mean, if they do, they always kind of say the same thing over and over again. Like, you know, make it groove harder or something like that, which I'm like, okay, we're on it. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> But, um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess just in, like general advice, like as corny and cheesy as it sounds is like, you know, don't, don't give up. If you have a passion for this thing, like make it your priority in life. And if you want to see it come to fruition, then you have to put in the work. Nothing is ever going to be handed to you. You can potentially get lucky with, you know, right place, right time, which is kind of something that happened with us. And that's how we ended up with sharp tone is, our managers were playing our music in the right place at the right time with someone at the label. And that's how they heard it, you know? So, I mean, but at the same time we got there and we were already signed to an, another label who was, you know, we were on the outs with, so it really did work out. And if, if we didn't get to that one place first by putting in all the, the hours and, and years of dedication, then, you know, we wouldn't have gotten to that point. So if you truly believe in what you're doing, don't, you know, don't treat it as just a hobby. Treat it as the thing you want to pursue. Because if you put as much energy into, you know, your hobby as you would your career or whatever, then you can make something of it. And just, you know, try to try to do something, I guess, that other people aren't doing. You know, don't try to sound exactly like your favorite band or whatever. You know, try to push and do something unique and stand out, you know. Well said. Yeah. I would probably say just don't overthink at the same time too um because obviously like this is a priority like if you're in a band for for so many people um but i feel the more when it comes to writing and like the overall game plan like it if you overthink it too much and you put like standards and like a timeline almost and if you don't meet those timelines or timeline standards that you're, you're trying to get to it's very discouraging way more discouraging if you don't have like such a you know just a a hard headspace towards that um but I feel like us, we were, I was in school, Danny was in school too. Um, Dave was working like a full-time job. The other two people in the band were also working full-time jobs. And um, we like trusted the music completely and it was still a priority, but it kind of just, it always works itself out basically. Like whether it's not now, it'll eventually come, you know, it's never set for anyone specific. Everyone's different. Excellent advice, gentlemen. I appreciate you guys doing this. You definitely did not have to, but it was way cooler that you did. You guys are awesome, man. I appreciate uh, you sticking around, hanging out with us, giving us some really good advice. The music is fantastic. If you guys are watching, please pick up Collapse by Design from Sentinels or just throw them a follow and some love on YouTube and Spotify. Appreciate you guys so much. Have an excellent day. Stay safe on the road. And uh, please don't be strangers. You're welcome back anytime you'd like. Thanks for having us. Thank you, guys. We appreciate you having us. Thank you, gentlemen. Dave and Chris. Have a good one, guys. Hell yeah! Yeah. (laughs) Thank you, fellas.